A very warm welcome to At Home with LMP and this episode of The Grounded Conductor with me, Timothy Henty. And this week we are talking about possibly one of the most important things in a conductor's toolkit for musical society as we know it, and that is programming and devising children's concerts. With the debate of STEM versus STEAM and the ever increasing difficulty it seems, to uh, get funding and support for concerts for young people. It is all the more important that everybody, including the conductor, really understands how these concerts are put together, who they are for, and how we deliver them effectively. We have three fantastic guests on the programme today, all with three completely different ways of approaching the same problem. The first, Alistair Malloy, Principal Percussionist of the BBC Concert Orchestra and also internationally known from here to Malaysia and Hong Kong and even further afield than that for his extraordinarily erudite and interesting programming idea. <laughs> him how he goes about devising these concerts in the first place. Well first of all I have to work out and find out what the aim of the concert is. Now if it's a concert specifically for schools then it's a question of knowing exactly which age group we're targeting. If it's a family concert then that's a different thing altogether. I would generally then try and find out roughly the kind of ages that they would expect to come along to their family concerts and then I would see if I can perhaps come up with something which might widen that a bit. So basically what I'm saying is I see a clear distinction between schools concerts and family concerts. However, they both come under the educational brief, but I would approach each one of those in a very different way. Let's take schools concerts first then, uh, because uh, you know to maintain uh, the role of music education within the curriculum, is a fighting battle really we we should be honest and say uh, and one that we're we're valiantly fighting as musicians um your role is very central to that um so what are you looking for in a school's concert i think the thing about putting together a school's concert is that first and foremost we have to remember that for the head teacher to sanction any trip from school it has to be really worthwhile now for us of course we know the value of music but i think to help the head teachers justify the trip, it's a good idea if the subject of the concert is perhaps broader than just music. So over the years I've put together schools concerts that touch on many other subjects, curricular subjects and also social subjects of interest to whatever age I'm targeting the concert for. So I've done schools concerts connecting music and maths, music and literature, music and science, music and geography, music on music and local history, all of those things, I think at least help justify the reason for the concert. Once you've got them there, of course, the focus is well and truly on the music. And of course, if there is another subject that you're hanging things on, that actually opens up the programming process in all sorts of interesting ways. And so, for example, putting together a program linking maths and music might seem really obvious to us as trained musicians, but when you actually look at it from another viewpoint, from a young child's viewpoint, even from a teacher's viewpoint, there are all sorts of extraordinary connections that are thrown up, and those open up interesting programming ideas. So Alistair, what you are uh, doing here is taking something that could be viewed as a problem uh, in the country where we are struggling to um, get music education into schools and uh, people to understand their value of it, you've actually sort of taken a back route of this and married all sorts of different subjects and sort of uh, almost slipped music education 
uh, under the wire there and uh, made it very possible for schools to uh, be involved with education and also justify the other curriculum, core curriculum subjects, which is a pretty impressive model. Um, and I remember doing, a, I definitely think we did a science one together at some point. We did. Um, and there was, uh, I think you put a little quiz in there at some uh, point, but the orchestra were constantly involved. So then my next question then would be, once you've married those things together, really once they're there, it's a concert and it's about music education as well. So where do you turn to for repertoire in that kind of thing? So when putting the music choices together for a school's concert of whichever age, it's really important to remember that this is a really important occasion for the children and indeed for the teachers. So therefore the music choices have to be absolutely perfect. The best possible choices that can be put in that programme, regardless of whatever connection you're making uh, outside music, the music itself and the performance has to be absolutely faultless. Um, my particular approach to programming all of my concerts, whether they're schools concerts or family concerts, if I've got an hour, I want to actually cram that hour full of lots and lots of different styles. Um, I would rather present some fantastically contrasting pieces in, in many different styles, many unexpected styles sometimes as well, than give over half the programme to one specific piece. That's just a personal thing. I, I, I think... I like that idea that, um, you know, the children might not particularly engage or, or a particular piece might not be their taste, but the next one might be. So it's this constant progression of pieces that hopefully at least one or two will absolutely make a connection with the different people in the audience. So that's my idea. So if I'm going to, in an hours long concert, I'm going to maybe set out to put in 10, 12 pieces of music. Um, the, you know, the longest one is probably going to be about six, seven minutes. Some of them will be three minutes. So I've got that as my set of building blocks for starters. And then you look at the shape of the program. So obviously you want to catch people's attention right at the start of your show. And then it's what you do with the line of your programming for the rest of it. Obviously you want to end on a high as well. So the then, the thing that then has to be addressed is where do you put the quieter moments? Where do you put the moments that actually take the audience down? And with an audience of school children, once again, of any age, that I think is where the real skill comes in, is in actually taking an audience down into a moment where they're listening for themselves rather than a moment where it's all high energy and everybody's engaged, which is also important. So it's looking at that line of the programme. My next guest takes the issue of programming and devising children's concerts equally seriously, but from the other end of the problem. Whereas Alistair deals primarily with symphony orchestras and bringing the children to the orchestra, my next guest, Kevin Hathaway, former co-principal percussionist of the Philharmonia Orchestra, brings the orchestra to the audience. which I believe is equally valid. I start by drawing on my childish mind. I've always been a bit of a kid at heart. And so it, um, several things come into play, whether the promoter has asked for a certain theme connected to the concert or whether they're giving me an absolute free hand. So those themes can, um, they can range from typical carnival of the animals to heroes and heroines to, uh, the Great Escape to Myths and Legends, to the circus, 
any of these themes obviously give you a very good base for starting off with your program. So if, for instance, I take uh, the circus, that's quite an easy one. My next question would be the age group that they're being aimed at. So whether it's a family concert, I have to be honest, I've planned probably hundreds of concerts in my lifetime, but one of the most important um, elements of all this is the age group of kids going to be there. So if it's in a school, they're captured. So their attitude is that probably it's going to be a music lesson. We soon get rid of that element once we start. However, going back to your initial question about the concert itself, if it's to only children, then the length of the piece is absolutely paramount because they're more interested probably in chewing their boiled sweet. However, if it's a family concert, and I much prefer family concerts, then mum and dad or grandma is there in charge of the children. I don't particularly enjoy a large spread of age. So I don't really like to go from the baby up to age 19. I quite like doing upper juniors because at that point, seven to 11, you've got their imagination captured. They haven't been raped by society and they are still in that kind of fun. Education is still fun with no exams attached. So I have the, word, the, the important thing is fun, isn't it? And getting the message across. So this is not going to be a Bruckner 7 opportunity for me to conduct. It's going to be much more um, eight or nine pieces, probably of only three and a half minute length, all of which will contain an element whereby either the orchestra are being musically stupid or the audience are being asked to join in with some probably rhythmic element or possibly a song, possibly singing, possibly the brass section playing gazoos. To me, it's got to be something that's fairly attractive. Um, one of the things that I always think about, obviously, is the acoustics, how big the hall is. If it's huge, we're up against it. Boys and girls nowadays are used to really cranking up the volume to number 11, and uh, we can't compete really as a classical music orchestra in, in a big hall. So I rather like small venues where we can jump off the platform and literally be in amongst them. In fact, Possibly my favourite opening for a family concert is doing Bolero, our shortened version of Bolero, not the 16 minute version, where we start with the orchestra actually in the audience. Otherwise, it can still be, whether we like it or not, there is still a them and us kind of situation being created. So once I start putting those all in the mix, and as you well know, Tim, when you're planning a concert, many of these things are active ingredients and they happen naturally. To many animateurs and presenters and conductors, this is a, a natural phenomenon, all these little questions being asked. So you really go to focus on content and it's the content that is going to grab them. So a really good beginning, a really good ending, and then possibly a little bit of subliminal education in the middle. From the moment I come on stage in any concert, whether it's a school's concert or a family concert, I want to establish trust and that trust is really important. I need the audience to absolutely trust me, first of all, to discover that, yep, I'm the guy who knows what I'm talking about and I'm going to talk them through the programme. Secondly, stick with me. We will have some fun along the way. And, uh, and thirdly, because, of course, I'm a percussion player, you know, I'm likely to play something at some stage in the programme. Not every programme, mind you. I only put in pieces for me to play if they're absolutely right to, to, to the project. So I need to establish that trust. Once I've established that trust, then I think I can take an audience anywhere. So when it comes to the, the more challenging pieces, and for me, the, the Baroque pieces are great because there's a, a wonderful rhythm and, and inevitability, momentum to those. Classical pieces uh, like Mozart, uh, um, the right kind of pieces there. They, once again, they've got a sort of inevitability and they've got a, a lightness of touch that's, that's easy to access. It's when you get into the romantic repertoire that I think things become more challenging because that whole concept of romantic expression through music is, is a really 
adult intellectual way of expressing yourself. And that's not to say that no romantic pieces uh, are, are appropriate in these concerts. I've used many of them myself, but I have to approach them in such a way that I allow myself the time to explain why this piece is trying to put something of an emotional response or trying to trigger an emotional response uh, through to the audience. So once the audience have got a feeling of trust from me, I feel that I'm able to explain things in a way that will set up a piece like that. Uh, it is tricky because, you know, sometimes people say, oh, you've got to make sure you, you put in a, a complete symphonic movement and otherwise, what's the point? Otherwise, you're dumbing down. Well, again, I would say it has to be a really carefully chosen symphonic movement. Um, uh, and, and that's the thing. I think another really important thing here, Tim, is, is we're talking about duration of pieces. And so a, a wonderful piece like the Hebrides Overture, which, you know, has got a fabulous story behind it. It's also got that wonderful backstory about uh, Mendelssohn being so overcome with seasickness that, uh, that he was confined to his bed after the trip. And that's when he wrote the piece. I love that kind of backstory to it. But here's the problem. It's a 10 minute overture. It's 10 minutes long. And, and for me, as, as I've already said, I would rather in the space of 10 minutes put in two different pieces than one 10 minute piece if a program's an hour long. So this is where I, I would put in a cut. Now, I know that people frown about cuts and, and people can, can understandably be purist about this. However, a really well chosen cut can actually work wonders, in my opinion. Now, don't forget, I've been doing this a long time. I've stood up in front of many, many, many orchestras, and I've never once had any musician come and uh, you know take me on uh, or give me a hard time of putting a cut in. That's because I spend a long time making sure that these cuts are, are, are actually going to be effective and not uh, a sudden lurch from one place to another. So, for example, in the Hebrides Overture, by taking out the lovely lyrical section with that beautiful clarinet solo in the middle, which is absolutely gorgeous. I'm afraid that for me, by taking that out, I leave the whole feeling of the storm and the, the stormy sea and the aftermath of the storm and leading up to Mendelssohn's seasickness. I leave that as the connection with the piece. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your repertoire now. One of the things that you're uh, quite famous for and well known for is uh, devising or uh, commissioning pieces which are unique to you and you have quite a repertoire of, of pieces. Uh, you always have quite a clear brief of what you want from that. So uh, where do the ideas for those actual pieces come from? The M1. I spend a lot of my time travelling on the M1 with the Philharmonia going up to Leicester. And... So consequently, I find my mind wandering. I mean, that sounds quite a flippant statement, but actually, it's true. My, my probably most successful group originally was called the Elastic Band. And that idea literally um, was devised with a percussionist called James Turner, literally on the M1, where we thought to ourselves, let's move away from a percussion ensemble identity and move into the orchestral field. And we thought, well, let's have one of every instrument in the orchestra and just put something together. And therefore, the M1 is a very interesting place to think. You've only got yourself and the van. And again, my ingredients for a successful piece of music is something which is a little bit wacky. If they want to watch a proper, in inverted commas, orchestra, they can either listen to a CD, watch a DVD, go to a, um, a, um, an informative concert, whereas with our concerts, we've always got to find the basic ingredient is, is it attractive? Is it compelling? Is it going to make them want to come again? And if, they are, if there's any unwavering sense of hesitation about the answer to that, you are failing. I think for us as, as you know, experienced musicians, if we look at a suite, there is a line within the movements and I think programming for a school's concert or a family concert should have the same sort of line as would exist in a suite. Um, so each movement, although separate and individual and different in style, are all part of the one 
overarching thing. Now, that's fine. If a composer has written a suite, it's the one composer, it's the, it's, it's the one voice in different styles. But if, if we're drawing from different musical time periods, different composers, different styles, different origins, then it's, um, it's a much more challenging and I think a much more fun thing to do to put together. So for example, to take a, a movement from a ballet, uh, or to take um, perhaps something from film or television, to take a short self-contained classical work and to try and find a way of programming those, positioning those within a program so that actually there is a journey within that for the audience. Now, there are some key factors along the way here. Recognition is, is absolutely crucial, but it's wrong, in my opinion, to assume that you have to only put in pieces that you think the children will recognize. Um, I think that children relate to a style of music really, really well, whether or not they've heard it before. Uh, something really lovely and quirky like the, uh, the polka from the Age of Gold Ballet by Shostakovich is wonderfully quirky. Uh, you wouldn't expect children to have heard that before, but I've used that in a lot of my programs and it immediately gets their attention and holds it to, to the end. Recognition is a key thing as well. I think I view recognition as quite often a reward after a challenging piece in a program, a piece that, that I know that they won't know that's perhaps a little bit longer, perhaps a little bit more challenging, or perhaps a piece that's much quieter than anything else in the program, I would then balance that up with something that I know is going to be instantly recognized. And so those, those kind of pairings work well for me in a program. So when people say to me, what are you trying to do with your concerts? One, encourage an audience of the future, although that's a massive, huge umbrella question for everybody to ask, not just musicians. How do we attract people into concert halls? But for children, they have to feel comfortable. Very often when you talk to people about coming to the Royal Festival Hall or Fairfield Hall, they're worried by seeing an orchestra in tails. They never see people in tails. So consequently, what we're trying to do is make people feel comfortable. We want them to come in and go, oh, this is fun, this is relaxing. And our music can obviously do that. There is no them and us in my concerts. We're all one. And so when we touch on why are we doing them, obviously we say audience of the future. However, I just want music to be a part of their life. In schools, as we all realize, music has been dwindled away to virtually nothing compared to when I was a child. And um, everybody talks in the press or on TV about how the arts is so important. And it is. Unfortunately though, it's not always accessible. Our concerts are extremely accessible. No one needs to feel worried in any way whatsoever. I think the most important thing that we can set out to get across is not just how fantastic an orchestra sounds and not just how fantastic the music that an orchestra plays sounds and is. I think the really important thing that we should feel we want to get across is how much we enjoy doing what we do. And I think that the musicians if they are given the right kind of program to play, will certainly sit up straight and show their enjoyment physically through their body language and through their, their facial gestures. I think that that is absolutely crucial. And if we pass that message on about how much we enjoy doing what we're doing and the children or the audience then responds to that, they will then go off and tell their friends hey, I went to this amazing concert the other day. It was fantastic. This happened, that happened. Everybody was having a great time. It's like that pebble in the pond effect. The ripples go out and people actually think, wow, that, that sounds absolutely amazing. I must make a point of going along and seeing and hearing an orchestra at some point. If we can achieve that, job done. 
Having worked with both Kevin and Alistair many times over the years as a conductor, and in fact as an arranger in Kevin's case as well, uh, it's a great pleasure to have them both on the programme, because I believe that they're both equally passionate artists about children's concerts and uh, the importance of them, but they approach children's concerts from two ends of the issue, and I feel both are valid and both have room in our musical society. What we haven't spoken about is getting the children involved themselves. And my next guest is something of an expert at that. He's a percussionist, his name is James Goffrey, and he is extraordinary at the way he does this because it's not just a few people that uh, he gets involved in his concerts, it is sometimes hundreds of children that he manages and teaches to play seemingly quite complicated rhythms in seemingly quite short space of time. He is an expert workshop leader, and it's a pleasure to have him on the programme. James Godfrey. So how do, I, how do we go about sort of approach it? I suppose the, the thing, the, the way that I get presented to one of those concerts is it's I'm brought in from a sort of an external point of view usually, um, and it's, I'm given a theme so it might be uh, that it's an arts week or that it's a, um, a particular special concert or whatever it is. So I take, I take that as a main theme. Um, and then obviously we, we go from a, a point of view of, um, you know, the, the percussion being the main instrument and that's what it all is. It's all a sort of percussion thing. Um, so, uh, I would approach it and I splitting it up into groups. Um, and sort of overlapping that sort of thing um, to get these layers of rhythm. And obviously being a percussionist, uh, as, as I am, um, I use those influences that I've taken from my experience in um, Latin, uh, Latin American music and samba and, and then African music and all those amazing uh, influences of, of rhythm and, and, and the, the beat that they make us feel um, is, is what uh, I sort of tr try to, to bring out in, in the rhythms that we give to the children to do. Um, well, I think I'm always amazed really that the, the, what you can achieve with quite young children, so like George's age of, of, of six, um, you, you can get them to do relatively complex things. So the question being, do, do I keep the rhythms that I use specific to a cer certain type of, of, of rhythm, be it samba or you know, um, African drumming or from Cook Island or whatever. Um, and the answer is no, but I, I use my experience that I have in all of those um, to sort of put something together that works, that I know will work for the type of scenario that I'm in, for the brief that I'm set. So, uh, and, and it always works. It might not be strictly the best thing to do in some people's eyes, but for me, um, it, 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 does, it does work and it's always very effective. So I take the best bits really, I suppose, um, and, uh, and, and overlap all those. And so it's really, a, it's really more about the experience, the overall effect, rather than really adhering to, to, the, to the, the, the main basis of those, of those rhythm sounds. And that's how I do it. Okay, so do, do you want an example of a, of a word rhythm? I would, I'd love one. Mm. Okay, cool, let's give, let's give you one. Um, so one of the ones that, that a, a word rhythm that we might use um, or in, a, in, in like drum kit learning and a bell pattern is, is um, don't like cabbage, I like potato. Don't like cabbage, I like potato. I don't like cabbage, I like potato. Okay. But, but then if I was going to use that rhythm in a certain, a certain situation, perhaps uh, with the London Mozart players, I might change it to um, uh, Mozart players are based in Croydon, the Mozart players are based in Croydon. So go then. Tim, why don't you try? Why don't you try and right, okay. say it and stuff? All right, say so, uh, Mozart. Uh, 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 Something like that. Something like that. Yeah, I think it went just, just slightly awry in, in the middle section. Actually. <laughs> uh, and so then I might layer. Uh, I might layer on top of that. Um, uh, we talk about uh, clave patterns, and, and and so I might put uh, like a two-three clave pattern. Um, and it might go something like this. You've got to put a sniff in at the beginning because there's, there's a rest. At the beginning. So it might go at home, L M P, at home, L M P, at home, L M P. So then if we put those two together, we get. What do we get? 
It will come as no surprise to you that James and I are very close friends and we've also just recently uh, taken possession of green screens and are trying to work out how to, how to use them. So uh, let's get a little bit of a practical element into this episode and perhaps you'd even like to sing along yourself so that you get a first-hand appreciation of what James tries to impart to his students. He starts by teaching a 2-3 song clave, which I will let him demonstrate and move on to Cascara, two of the most fundamental rhythms in all of Latin American music, if not the two fundamental rhythms of Latin American music. Very complicated, but he gets children to do it. Let's see how he does it. Um, L -M -P. I suppose it's my turn. The Mozart players are based in Croydon. So this is the pass, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it will fit, but. The Mozart players are based in Croydon. Well, we're having fun, but this is about involving children and young people in live music and getting the next generation enthused. So we need to do a little rehearsal for the next bit with my new assistant, who also happens to be my six-year-old son, George. With a young age group like George's, we might not introduce Cascara as we would with older children, but there are many ways for them to be involved. How would you teach us something? Let's say, say uh, you know, it's an afternoon school, Friday afternoon, special treat. Mm -hmm. And I've got my amazing helper here. Uh, what would you What would you teach us on a Friday afternoon to send us off into the weekend? Uh, well, um, I think with uh, with what we've been talking about, we're trying to uh, to put together different rhythms and layering different rhythms on top of each other. Um, yes. So the, the best the best way, uh, particularly with young people, to do that is, uh, is to try and kind of use some words and things like that. So uh, we want to build up some rhythms, which we tend to call the riff. Uh, but then also we'll have some extra bits which we call our breaks and those are kind of things that everyone do together. So um, I think maybe we could try and learn uh, one of these breaks and it goes like this, I'll demonstrate in a moment, okay? It's like a, what we call a call and response. Uh, so I do something first and then you kind of respond with it. So it goes like this, I go, I want a cup of tea and your response is, me too. All right, so let's just try that, okay? So I'm going to say, I want a cup of tea and you respond with me too. Okay, oh. He's Amazing. Do you know, that, that was, yeah, it's like it's like you've been practicing. It's like, okay, so let me demonstrate the whole thing, right? So I would go, I want a cup of tea. Me too. I want a cup of tea. Me too. I want a cup. Yeah, I want a cup. Yeah, I want a cup of tea. Me too. That's it. <laughs> so uh, once we've learned that, and we'll probably go over it quite a lot, but for the purpose of this, we're going to go straight in. So we're going to do it. I'm going to go first, and you respond with the me too. We're going to have our four whistles. Here it comes. I want a cup of tea. Me too. I want a cup of tea. Me too. I want a cup. Yeah. I want a cup. Yeah. yeah. I want a cup of tea. Me, Me too. too. Yeah. A simple ongoing riff taught by means of a recognisable phrase interspersed with breaks call and response being particularly effective, especially for younger children, is a relatively quick, enjoyable way of getting children of all ages and abilities to join in with live music making and actually being part of the concert rather than just watching it. I'll let you in on a secret. I started life as a percussionist and James and I were both in the same year group at the Royal College of Music in London where we studied with, you guessed it, our guest Kevin Hathaway. Making up the quartet of our year group were Matthew West and James O'Carroll, both now regular sites in London's West End, and I count all three of them among my very greatest friends. All of us have maintained a proactive love of teaching and involving young people in concerts, and it was of little surprise to me that they all wanted to be involved in this little performance for you. I want a cup of tea. 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 I
demonstration of what it's possible to achieve in a relatively short space of time with an audience or participants of mixed age and ability to really get them involved uh, very quickly in music making and give them a sense of achievement and hopefully inspire them. Um, now you might well be thinking this is all very well but what's it got to do with conducting and um, here I think it's important to make the point that in my view it's got everything to do with conducting. When you look at the word conducting, um, in German, Dutch, Italian to name a few, um, the word is dirigent, dirigent, direttore, um, it implies directorship and leadership and of course it's completely true. As much as that is a, a sound description of what a conductor is, the English term conductor I think is a, is a more accurate philosophy on, and uh, as, uh, imagery for the 21st century. It is, we are literally a conduit between the music, the musicians and the audience. And the modern conductor, the grounded conductor, the conductor with his or her feet on the ground in this society, should take it as a sacred responsibility to promote the values of the composer, the musicians, the audience, and by any means necessary, the next audience. This is not self-preservation, this is the preservation of the art form. And if we can't communicate through any means necessary, whether it be gestural language, or whether it be working with young people, if we can't communicate those ideas, then what indeed is the point of us. So I do believe that every conductor should be, as a sacred responsibility, being involved with the education of young people and the promotion of the sheer joy that is music and music making. So that's what I feel about that. And um, join us next week for the last episode of the Grounded Conductor, The Grounded Conductor 4, which, as a, as a good follow-on from what I've just said, concentrates on what it takes to be a great conductor. And we look at some great conductors of the past and ask questions about what we can learn from them. Until then, have a fantastic week. <laughs>